Hi everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. I've picked a couple of topics uh, to talk about and one is, um, well they're both topics that I'm enjoying digging up some research on and they affect a lot of people. The first one we'll start with is cancer screening. Um, I would say probably most people in the United States still think that cancer screening saves lives and the myth is perpetuated by doctors, hospitals, nonprofits supporting cancer research like the American Cancer Society and institutions that profit from both administering the tests and using them as recruitment tools to offer treatment to patients. Rarely is the lack of efficacy for these tests discussed and the potential harms from overdiagnosis and overtreatment usually are left out of the discussion too. So a recent study um, was very interesting. The researchers decided to look at how often the potential for harm is quantified in studies looking at cancer screening. The authors reviewed data from randomized trials that evaluated things like the efficacy of cancer screening for reducing the incidence of cancer, death from cancer, and all-cause mortality. They also looked at whether or not um, incidence of harm type, type data was provided separately for both screening and control groups. Those outcomes were, uh, that they measured were false positives, overdiagnosis, negative psychological or social consequences, invasive follow-up procedures, all-cause mortality and withdrawals due to adverse um, effects. Now, this issue of psychological and social consequences, I just want to take a second and point out. I did a, an episode of video clips on this cancer screening. I've done several of them this year, actually. And um, one study showed that people who get false positives, they're told they, that they might have cancer, so they have to be tested again. Two years later, they're just as freaked out from a psychological perspective as the people who actually had cancer. So this is not, this type of thing isn't something that we should be so dismissive of, in my opinion. Well, 57 trials were included involving 10 different screening interventions for 57 million study participants, and so that's a pretty amazing data set right there. False positives were quantified in only 2 out of 57, overdiagnosis in only 4 studies, negative psychological or social consequences in only 5, invasive follow-up procedures in 27, a little bit better there, all-cause mortality in 34, and withdrawals because of adverse side effects <clears throat> Excuse me, in only 1 study. The screening trials that they used, by the way, lots of different testing methods, included testing breast cancer, testing for breast cancer with mammography, self-exam or clinical exam, colon cancer with endoscopy, fetal occult blood testing or virtual colonoscopy, and lung cancer with either chest x-ray or low-dose spiral computed tomography. So lots of different cancers, lots of different methods of testing. Now this was interesting, the median percentage of space in the results section that quantified harm is only 12%, which means that 88% of the content of the article in these cases was devoted to telling you how fabulous the screening was and only 12% on average to things that might go wrong. The authors concluded that cancer screening trials rarely quantify the potential harm that can result from screening. The two most important ones, overdiagnosis and false positives, were only included in 7 and 4% respectively. The authors reported that the benefits of cancer screening were quantified much more often than the potential for harm and that we should be offering a fair and balanced picture to consumers so they could make educated decisions based on accurate information. And of course, we have a couple of problems here, one of which is that health professionals, even to the extent that they read the scientific journals, and I don't think they do it enough, and that's just my opinion uh, and my experience, but they're getting nothing but information on how fabulous all this stuff is, not much on the downside. So um, it really is incumbent on consumers to know this stuff these days and, and to protect themselves by learning how to do something which I've said for years is very important when you go into a doctor's office, which is to just say no. All right, so my other uh, source of misinformation here that I want to talk about or, or a topic of misinformation is this continuing issue of salt. The topic of sodium and its effects on health greatly misunderstood and that's perpetuated by government agencies and health organizations that in, just insisting that sodium restriction should be applied to the general population. I think every day I see some article that says that um, that comes from a health agency recommending that salt you know, cons or salt uh, content in packaged foods should be reduced and some manufacturers saying we've lowered the salt in our soup or whatever. Well, a new study shows that salt intake is actually regulated by the brain rather than how much salt is in the food supply. And this is in direct contrast to what all these health authorities are saying. They're basically saying that salt availability has increased. That's therefore increased intake in salt in the population. And then that therefore has caused an increase in the rates of things like hypertension. 
but that's actually not what is actually going on. So let me explain the study. The study looked at 129 surveys that looked at sodium intake from more than 50,000 people in 45 countries over 50 years. So we're talking about a great big bunch of people over a long time here. The average salt intake was between 2,600 and 4,800 milligrams a day. Now just to put that in perspective, current World Health Organization guidelines recommend intake of salt at 2,000 milligrams of sodium a day. 75% of the world's population consumes twice this amount. And you might remember of uh, previous uh, video clips where I talked about salt and mentioned that 99% um, of the pop population of the world, we're talking about you know, 7 billion people times 99%, not compliant with our health authority's salt recommendations. I mean, something needs to change, obviously. The article reporting the study included many interesting details, and I'll just give you a couple of them. Uh, it was a long article, and, and I enjoyed reading it, but just a couple highlights here. Um, you know, we continue to recommend lower and lower amounts of salt, despite consistent data uh, demonstrating that lower sodium intake is not associated with lower risk of cardiovascular disease or all-cause mortality. Salt intake is not decreasing in the United States. And research shows that sodium intake is physiologically determined uh, parameter that's not altered by the amount of the food supply. So what the researchers concluded at the end of the day is that salt intake has remained fairly constant for about 50 years, regardless of changes to the food supply. The brain controls the human appetite for sodium, and intake is actually controlled within a narrow range, but one that is much higher than what all the health authorities are saying we should aspire to achieve. They stated, and this is direct quote, thus our analysis indicated that there is a normal range of human sodium intake defined by physiology and biological needs and not by the food supply. No matter how well intended, public policy simply cannot alter physiologically set parameters. Now this is consistent with Dr. McDougall's research and statements and my own research. Basically humans um, have taste receptors for salt for a really good reason, because we are supposed to consume salt. And that uh, he also states, and my research shows, that salt restriction is counterproductive for most people, often bringing about the health issues it's designed to prevent. So we can only hope that one day the medical community will catch up and recognize the error of its ways and stop this misdirected um, attempt to lower sodium consumption for the whole population. There are people, by the way, just to be clear, who are salt sensitive. I'm not suggesting that we encourage those people to eat more salt, but my gosh, we've got to stop taking a tiny subset of the population and recommendations for those people and trying to translate them for the general population. So that's all for now and for the week. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think should watch it, and I'll be back to you again on Tuesday.